So I've used ASP.NET Core 2 MVC to program this fully functional online shop. As I'm making this video, it's in full production. Anyone can swing over to cartridgewiz.co.uk, select themselves some compatible printer cartridges, and buy them with real money, either by credit card or PayPal, whereupon some real cartridges will be delivered to them. There's an area for the warehouse staff to print, suspend, refund, resolve, and generally administrate orders. And there's an area for administrators to add, delete, and edit products. It uses foundational features of ASP.NET Core 2 and the MVC, such as convention-based routing, model binding, projecting link queries into custom collections, CRUD operations, partial views, view components, and I've made a two-part video demo of those. role-based security and a whole lot more besides. It's fully responsive. And the database was spun up on an exclusively code-first basis. But now, brothers and sisters, in the words of Joey Tribbiani, it's time to really sex this puppy up. And I can't think of anything sexier than creating an API endpoint and Ajaxing into it to update a fragment of the DOM asynchronously. Well, clearly I need to get a life, but in the meantime, I've got a lot of coding to do, so let's crack on. So a la Google, I've got this single inviting search box right there on my home page, but Unlike Google, if I start typing in a likely printer name here, like HL-31, I don't get a drop-down of search suggestions that we're all pretty much used to seeing these days. Now, it so happens that HTML5 is supposed to have something which takes care of exactly that kind of thing. So let's try and run up a completely HTML5 implementation of this Ajax and see where that gets us. So the first thing I'm going to need is a route to my API. So coming to startup, it's in the configure method. And this is gonna be a very restrictive route, so it can go right at the top of everything. Just going to copy this one in and change it a bit. So what we're going to want is a, a literal path here. So only something asking for API slash is going to get there. And then we need what is basically a variable for the method on the controller. So by convention, that's called action. And then I'm going to want the sort of variable that's being passed in to the get. In this case, it's whatever the user is typing into the search box but it could be anything because we develop our API so I'm going to leave that deliberately vague as arg and then in the defaults what we just need to do here is basically designate that the controller will always be API and that should be fine then of course I need a controller to handle this so if I go um, control shift A, it's a new item. I could go with an API controller, but it puts in a load of uh, templating that I don't really need. So I'm just going to go with the basic controller class, which is going to be called API, of course. And we're not going to have any views. So let's just test that we're on the right track by returning some content. Let's just say 
got to API with, and what we want to do is pick up that argument with text interpolation. I can pull that out of model binding. But of course, we've got to pass it into our method. So this is going to be a string called arg. And let's run that up the flagpole. So I should be able to reach that endpoint now. And you can see it is returning got to API with arg my arg. So at the moment, we've got just about the worst API controller in the world. The first thing I'm going to do here is give this HTTP attribute of get, because clearly this is a get and it's in the docs. Trust me on that one. And here we're going to want to work the magic of getting the data back from the server. Now, I figure that because I've actually got the code that does the whole search, that if I go to my search controller, I should be able to get most of the code we need from there. So I'm going to use some cheeky, let's call it code reuse. That's in fashion, isn't it? And I'm going to copy all that because that's just about what we're going to need. We're not going to need anything to do with the session. Now the I product repository, as you can see, I'm using the repository pattern. That's got a red squiggly because I haven't got my domain models in yet. So let's bring those in, MVC shop models, to fix that up. My constructor is the wrong constructor because it needs to be API controller. And we don't need anything to do with the session. So what we've done in our constructor is essentially dependency injected the uh, repository that we're interested in. So suffice to say that we can get access to our data now. And we're going to call our method search suggestion. And there again, because I've already done some quite heavy lifting code in the search controller, I'm going to see if I can reuse that. Now, there are some complexities here because in the actual search, we are searching over more than one table. But just to get the shape of the code going, so we can see where we're headed with this, I'm just going to pretend for now that we're only searching in the table which contains the printer names. It is also the most likely thing that people are going to be searching. But I will come back at the end and fix that simplification. So here's our link query from printer name in repository dot printer names where printer dot name dot contains the arg we're calling it in our API and here we've got a join expression which we're not going to need what we will need here is simply we're just looking for a printer name from the printer names table which contain some of the things that have been typed into the search box. But I'm going to order those, can't just let them come out higgledy piggledy. So I'm going to say order by printer name dot, it'll be the name. And then you have to actually select something. So it'll be select printer name dot name. So we can return the data. So we're going to want a new JSON result and pass it query. So we're looking for API slash search suggestion. And then I'm going to pass it a string which I know occurs in a lot of printer names, which is MFP. And here you can see we've got, well, it's basically an array expressed as JSON, isn't it? A load of strings that all contain MFP. Now off the top of my head, I don't know what the optimal size is for a search suggestion box, but let's for the moment say that it's gonna be 10. So let's come in here and say, take 10. 
And now that I come to think about it, there's actually nothing logically in our tables which would prevent us from having two printers with the same name. So I'm going to come in here and say distinct. Control Shift B to build that. I shouldn't need to start the server again. Let's refresh my page and see if we can cut down the amount of suggestions. Now we've got to get some action going on the client side. So if I come into my views, home and index CS HTML, this is where the Ajax works actually going to have to get done. But we're in the MVC, so the majority of these pages are just fragments, in fact, which are going to be rendered into the underscore layout.cshtml file. So I've got to make a section there which uh, these client pages can render into, which I haven't done yet in this application. So you can see in the head of layout, I've got a section called at render section head scripts. I'm going to control C to copy that and then come down to the bottom. And I'm not using any libraries like jQuery, which are going to sense the document being loaded. So the standard practice there is to put any random scripts that might have to read the DOM into a space just before the closing body tag. With complete lack of imagination, I'm going to call that foot scripts. In the index CSHTML, I want at section foot scripts. Write that out to the console to make sure that we've got a hookup there. And here you can see we're writing out to the console from foot scripts. So now in index CS HTML, we're going to need to put our data list in. And that's going to have to have an ID. Search suggestion list. And now we've got to link it up to the text box. We do that by introducing a list property and setting it to the same name. The event that we want to be using on our text box is the input event. So in our script, we're going to want to get hold of our text box now and add an event listener to it. So we want here document dot get element by ID and it will be well, it's being provided by the tag helper, but that will come out as search string when it comes out in the wash dot add event listener. And as I've already said, we want to be listening for the input event in the best of all possible worlds, in the best of all possible browsers. Then we need here the name of a function that we're going to call when this event is fired. And we're going to call that function update search suggestion. Now we're also going to have to get hold of our data list. Now we've got to write this function that we've specified here to respond to the input event. The environment provides me with information about what produced this event. All I have to do is reach out my hand and collect that in with a parameter here, which I'm going to call E. I just want a variable to refer to our endpoint on the server, which we've already set up. Let's call it API target. It's just the URL. And then the variable part. So that we're going to have to get by concatenating whatever was in the text box, which is going to be the event source dot target dot value. Now we're almost at the business end and it's time to do the Ajax and I'm just going to copy in something I prepared earlier. Now the reason is that this code is completely standard. There's like about a thousand YouTube videos about it. So I don't want to say too much about it apart from the fact that up until xhr.send, which is our Ajax object, the code is completely synchronous. 
the asynchronous part comes in because the XHR dots on ready state change, we don't know when that's going to happen. We've got no control. It's going to happen at some point in the future. That's the sense in which this is asynchronous. The only thing we're worried about is when we get our data back from the server, what are we going to do? The result of all this is that we're getting back a dirty great string of JSON. And the key word there is string because JSON is a string. So the first thing we need to do is deserialize it and get it into an object so we can manipulate it in memory. So we need a variable which is going to be an array to put this in. Let's call it uh, suggestions array. And that's going to be equal to JSON dot pass. And then we want the XHR response text. Now, as we go on, because we're going to do this repeatedly, we're going to have to scrub out any previous elements that the data list has so that we don't just keep adding option elements to it ad infinitum. Ellie data list dot inner HTML equals null. And then, of course, we want to populate the data list. So what we can do is use the for each method on the suggestions array to iterate through it and create an option element for each element in the array. Sounds a bit complicated, but it's really not too bad. Into the for each, we're going to have a function. And the function is going to take in the value of whatever the element is on the array of whatever element we're on in other words we'll just call that item so here as we're on an item in the array we're going to have to make a new option element of the type option the option dot value is going to be the value of the item that we're on. So just item. And then, of course, we need to append this option item to the data list. So that's just le data list dot append child and pass it the option. Save that and run the project. So fingers crossed, let's go with HL. And there you see we're getting the uh, search suggestions populating immediately. We are rocking and we are rolling. But we're not over the finish line yet. If we have a look at these search suggestions and I'm hitting the down arrow and I press enter when I'm on the L2340DW, it puts it into the search box. But then I still have to press enter to get the full search. What I'm actually expecting, and you certainly get this in Google, is when I've come down to this item, I can just hit enter or indeed click on it and it will actually trigger the search. So I thought that's okay. All we need to do is go to the on select event. But I was quite surprised to find out that there isn't one. The only thing we can get on select for is for the text in input boxes or text areas. So that would be something more like if I were to select the text like that, I could get an on select. But there is something we can do. As the input events come in, we're going to see if the value that we've now got in the text box is exactly the same as any of the values in the data list. And if it is, we're going to take the draconian decision that they must have selected it, and then we're going to submit the form. Now, it does have a slight weak point, but this almost always works, and I'm going to leave it as homework for those that want to know where the weak point is to find that weak point. Bit cheeky, I know, but I'm in that kind of mood. Before we do anything to update our search suggestions, we want to have a look at the values in the data list. So le data list dot child nodes dot we're going to have to iterate through them. So I've got four each because it's a sort of a pseudo array. 
And for each of them, we're going to have an anonymous function. And we're going to get that function to take in the element of the array that we're on, basically. So I'll call that option. Then we're going to do something. Well, we're going to have a look at its value and see if the value in this option element is the same as the value that's now in the text box. If so, it's going to be option dot value. If that equals e dot target dot value, then what's in the text box is exactly the same as something that's in the data list. And if that's the case, we're going to submit the form. And just to make sure that nothing else executes, I'm going to return false from here. Save that. No need to compile the whole thing. I'll just refresh the page to get the new JavaScript in there. So now we should be able to go HL whatever, come down to the L2300D, and I'm just going to hit enter and bang. It actually does the search, and now we're in the full search results. We'll try that with a click now. If I click on HL3150 and bang, it fires it. Now, just as one final refinement on this JavaScript before we leave it, at the moment, it'll start searching. Even if I just type in a single character, if I put a C in there, we get some results from the early part of the Cs. But I'm not convinced that a search on one character in this context is going to be that meaningful. What I'm going to do is come in here and at the start of everything, we're only going to contemplate doing anything at all to the data list if there are, say, at least two characters in there. If the length is less than, well, let's see how two feels, then we'll return false, which will just get us out of the function. So now if I type in C, it shouldn't suggest anything. But if I come on to the next letter, then we get them again. Let's try the same thing with, say, H, nothing, L, and then we start to get some suggestions. Bippity boppity boo, we are done with the client side Ajax. As I said earlier, just to get the shape of the code sorted out, I have oversimplified the situation on the server side. The reason is that people might be searching product codes as well as printer names. And unfortunately, product codes are in a different table. Now, it is actually far more likely that people are going to be searching printer names than product codes. So what I'm going to do is if we have indeed got 10 results from printer names, we'll just return those 10. And if we haven't got 10, we'll start to top up to 10 with results from the product code table. So what I'm going to do here is take this query into an array. So if there are exactly 10, then we've got no more space to top up. So we'll return what we've got. But if we go beyond this block, we're going to need an offset to find out how many short of 10 we are. And that's going to be 10 minus the printer name suggestions length. So now we've got to get some product code suggestions from somewhere. And if we think back to my original search controller, I've got queries in there which get us on the right path. So I'm just going to copy this and put it in here. We're not going to want anything to do with a join. From product in repository.products, not repository.printer names, you'll notice, where product.skew contains, we're going to have arg in there. And I'm going to want to take the offset, whatever that is, to top up back to 10. And it's not liking it here with the red squiggle. And it's because we need to evaluate this complete expression before we do dot distinct. 
Let's get those into an array. But just because we search them, we might not actually have any, mightn't we? Because there might not have been any hits. So in that case, we're actually just going to be returning the original printer name suggestions, however many there are. So if the length of that array is zero, all we're doing is returning the original printer name suggestions. So if we've got past that block, then we have got some results from the product code search and we're going to have to resize our array because say the offset was five, then we'd be asking for five results, but there might only be two, in which case we're going to have to resize the array to seven, etc., etc. First of all, we need to calculate the new array size we need. And this is going to be equal to 10 minus the offset plus however many results we've got back from the product code search. So now what we're going to do is resize the printer name suggestions and weld the two together. So we want array dot resize. Which array are we resizing? Well, I need to pass it by reference because it's no good changing a copy of it. We want the actual one changed. Printer name suggestions, and we want to resize it to the new array size. So we've got SKU suggestions dot copy to. Where are we copying it to? Printer name suggestions. And now we want the index of the array to start copying at. 10 minus the offset. All we need to do now is exactly the same as we've done before, which is return the new JSON result of printer name suggestions, although we've mangled it up quite a lot now. So I'll just control C to copy that line from there and put that there. Control L to delete lines. Okay, so let's run that. Control F5. Now I happen to know that TN is a string that occurs in some printer names and some product codes. We can see here we've actually got five printer names that have been pulled out. And obviously the printer names stop there. And I happen to know that TN dash are all brother product codes. So it has searched across the two tables and joined the results together once there weren't enough printer name results. Now there aren't any printers that have TN dash in them. So if I hit dash now, it then starts to go for more and more product code results. As you can see there, they're all product codes. But how are we doing in other browsers? In Firefox, we look to be fine. In Edge, at first it appears as if it doesn't work properly because we only start to get these TN results. But if we have a look at the DOM, the correct results are there, but Edge is applying an extra filter. In other words, it's ignoring the things where the uh, TN doesn't appear at the start of the string, which is not all that unreasonable now that I come to think about it. So I think we can certainly live with this in Edge. Internet Explorer. No, we're getting nowhere with Internet Explorer. So I really don't feel that bad about Internet Explorer because if we look on can I use worldwide, only about 2% of people are using it. Users can still do the search and, and it works. Now, if you're my boss and you tell me, Mark, you know, we've got to fix this and support these users. There are things you can do. There's some polyfills. Here's one, here's another. So we could start to spend time getting involved in that if we feel we need to. But the worst case scenario is that with this, what you might call standard solution, what the modern solution should be, we have even now got about 90% of people covered so according to Agile principles, if we wait until the monolithic issue is completely and utterly resolved, we could be waiting forever. Whereas if we've got a solid, 
albeit imperfect step forward, we should deploy that into production as soon as we can. And that, mes amis, is exactly what I did. As I'm making this video, your good self and anyone else in the world can boogie down to cartridgewiz.co.uk and see the code in this video cavorting in its natural habitat in a fully functioning core MVC webshop.